Hi, Sully's on the couch and he's ready and I'm ready and Scout is here and she's already walked across the keyboard several times. I guess she's upset that I missed la posting a video last week. So anyway, I'm Miss Collier and I guess everybody's ready. And today we're gonna talk about the Donner Party, which was not a party you wanted to go to. It happened during, it was a, a wagon train, which was traveling to California and things went really badly wrong. And it is pretty much a story of how a group of people made every single wrong decision that they could possibly make and got into all kinds of bad situations over it. Scout's very excited this morning. We don't know how many times we're going to walk across the keyboard, but we're just going to keep moving. Okay, let me share my screen here. My mad technical skills. And we will start talking about the Donner Party. And this is part of the um, Manifest Destiny movement, which was kind of the, the time period when people in America started thinking that, hey, you know, there's all that land out there to the West and there's nobody living in it, which we know is absolutely not true. There were lots of Native Americans living out there. It was actually, California was actually still part of Mexico at this point. There were lots of people already living there, but for some reason the, the American settlers decided those people didn't count and manifest destiny literally meant to them that God wanted them to have this land and it was their job to go out there and get it. So lots of settlers were traveling in wagon trains because there was no railroad yet at this point that went out to the west. If you were going to go, you went in a wagon train. So most of the travelers had to leave Independence, Missouri, which was kind of the jumping off point for that was the furthest settlement to the West. That's the last place you could get buy food, buy equipment, buy flour, buy sugar, buy you know things that were had to be processed in mills and, and things. That is the last place you could get that. After that, it was roughly 2,000 miles, more than 2,000 miles. And the trip would take at least four months. And, and that's if everything went exactly right. If you ran into any kind of a problem, it was going to take longer than that. So you see that they had to travel here <clears throat> to the next place they would probably hit would be Fort Laramie, the little Sandy River, the Great Salt Lake Desert. And then Sutter's Fort was where they were going to. That was the place in California that they wanted to get. And there's a very large mountain range here, the Sierra Nevada mountain range, that they had to get over right there at the end to get to Sutter's Fort. Okay, so this is what we're looking at here. The, the uh, Donner Party was made up originally of two couples of men, George Donner and his wife and children and his brother Jacob and his wife and children and James Fraser Reed and his family and two servants. Now both of these families had some money and so they had several wagons each and they actually had hired men to help drive their wagons. Now when we think of wagons we tend, or at least I always tend to think of horses pulling these wagons, but these were very heavy wagons, and so they were generally pulled by oxen, which are very large cows, because they were just too heavy and horses broke down and couldn't go, couldn't make the whole drive to a whole um, trip pulling these wagons. It was just too, too heavy and too hard on them. Now, James Reed had read a guidebook published by a man named Lansford Hastings, who promised that he had found a new shortcut route that would save like 300 miles off the trip. And so he was very interested in that. What he didn't know was that Lansford Hastings had written this book before he ever found a shortcut. He was just figuring, well, I'll write this book. I'll get people started that way. And while they're starting that way, I'll go there and I'll find a shortcut real quick. And then I'll get rich because I'll have this book. So there was no shortcut at this point, but he was very interested in that. 
interestingly, uh, I had not known this and found this when I was doing research for this. Um, James Fraser Reed sold a lot of his businesses and had to, to finalize some various things and he needed a lawyer to help him with that. He's in Springfield, India, uh, sorry, Springfield, Illinois. I can't talk this morning. And the young lawyer who helped him with this and considered going with them on this trip was Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was very interested in going to the West, but he had a wife and two young children and she was not having it. And he had just started his political career. So think about the fact that, you know, if something had turned just a little bit differently, Abraham Lincoln might have been on this trip and what might have happened with what we know that Abraham Lincoln did later on. Think about that as you're listening to this story. So these two families leave Springfield, Illinois and begin the 250 mile trip to Independence, Missouri, which is the starting point. Now they're leaving on April the 15th. Traditional wisdom said that you needed to leave Independence in April to be able to make the trip reasonably safely. They're already a month late first bad decision. They get to Independence on May the 12th. So it's taken them almost a month to go this 250 miles. And that's still where there's roads and stuff. About 100 miles from Independence on May the 19th, they join a larger wagon train, which was led by a man named Colonel William Henry Russell. So it's actually called the Russell Party at this point. May the 27th, they're, they're continuing on. They get to the Big Blue River, which is in flood, and they can't cross it with their wagon, so they have to stop and build a giant raft to be able to take the wagons across the water. While they're doing all of that, Sarah Keyes, who is Margaret Reed's mother, dies of tuberculosis, and she was, she was elderly for that time period. She died, and they buried her there under some trees. Uh, May the 11th, I'm sorry, May the 31st, all of the wagons have now crossed the river. So here we are, the end of May, and they're just now moving on again. Okay. <clears throat> In June of 1846, on June the 16th, Tamsin Danner, sorry, Donner, who was George's wife, writes in a, in a letter that, um, they were at the Platte River, and they were 200 miles from Fort Laramie, which is in what is now Wyoming. She says that so far, the journey has been easier than expected. The party arrives at Fort Laramie on June the 27th, and James Reed meets a man named James Kleiman, who is an old mountaineer guy, and he has just returned from California with Lansford Hastings over the new shortcut. And he was on horseback and said, man, you can't go that way. I barely could make it on horseback. You can't do it in a wagon. Don't take the shortcut. He said it is impossible for wagons. And he advises that they continue with the established route. That seems like pretty good information to have, doesn't it? But James Reed ignores this information because, you know, the guy the book says, and he decides to trust the book instead of this man who has just been there. In July, on July the 17th, the party meets a rider at Independence Rock with a note from Hastings urging all of the new travelers coming that way to meet him at Fort Bridger. On the 18th, the party crosses the Continental Divide, which is kind of the middle point in the country. They've traveled a little over a thousand miles and they have a little more than a thousand miles left to go. They're roughly at the halfway point now and it's July. On the 19th, they reach the Little Sandy River, and the Donners and Reeds and several other families decide that this is where they're going to break off and follow the Hastings cutoff. George Donner was elected the leader of the party, and so now 
this is officially known as the Donner Party. They arrive at Fort Bridger on July the 27th. This is a picture of Jim Bridger down here. He was a famous mountain man. He had been a famous explorer in the mountains. And he is kind of older now, and he had retired and built Fort Bridger, which was a trading post. <clears throat> and they decide that they will rest there for four days. Hastings is not there. And so they kind of are waiting to see if he's going to turn up. Uh, on July the 31st, the Donner Party, which was now 74 people, leaves for the Hastings cutoff. And James Reed wrote that the cutoff should be cut almost 300 miles off of their trip. And they thought it would take them seven weeks to get to California now. In August, on August the 6th, the party found a note from Hastings saying that right now the shortcut is impassable and they should send a writer ahead to find him for instructions. That seems kind of ominous. James Reed sets out on horseback to find Hastings. On August the 10th, James Reed returns to the party, at, to the wagon train, after he had met with Hastings and gotten instructions. So on August the 11th, they continue, the party continues on on the new road, road, but progress is very slow because there's no set established path and they have to chop their way through the, the trees and the brush. So there is very little progress. The party is now up to 87 people and has 23 wagons because people keep coming along and joining the party. On August the 22nd, they entered the Salt Lake Valley, which in what is now Utah, and with one month of summer left, and they still have 600 miles to travel. Now think about it. It took them a month to make 250 miles from Illinois to Missouri back at the beginning, and now they're in a place where there's not actually any roads. Do you think they can make 600 miles in a month and be safe? I don't know. Well, I know, but I'm not gonna tell you yet. August the 25th, the, the party finds another note from Hastings warning that they need to prepare for the fact that they're gonna be crossing a desert. It should take them two days and there will be no water and they need to prepare and get ex extra water. So, um, August, they, they work on that for the next several days, and on August the 30th, they set out on their dry days of travel, what they believe is going to be two days. Well, on September the 3rd, they finish what turned out to be five days of travel with no water. 36 of their oxen and cattle had either run away or died during that, top, that five days. The party decides to rest for a week and search for the missing animals. Now they know they're almost out of time for the summer. But, and I realize that, you know, this is probably a very hard trip, but they sit down and they wait for a week. Bad decisions, bad decisions. On September the 10th, the party realizes that they don't have enough food to make it to California. So Charles Stanton and William McCutcheon are sent ahead to Fort Sutter, or Sutter's Fort, to get more supplies. On September the 26th, the party reaches the Humboldt River and rejoins the established trail. So they've gone through the cutoff now. <clears throat> the cutoff added at least 125 miles to their trip. And this picture here is the top of, is part of where the Hastings Pass is still. And this picture was taken in 1999, and it still looks like this. So you can imagine it didn't look any better in 1846. That's a messed up little trail right there. <coughs> so on October the 5th, James Reed and John Snyder, who was one of the Graves family's teamsters, one of the people that drove their wagons, got, had an argument, and Snyder tried to hit Reed in the head with his whip, and Reed hit him back and they kept fighting and at some point James Reed stabbed John Snyder and he died. The party gets together and votes now it's only the men that vote and they voted to banish James Reed and tell him he could not travel with the party anymore. That was his punishment for killing somebody. He what they weren't going to stop and hang him or anything like that. But they did say, you know, that's it for you. You're out. 
So he leaves the party and continues on to Sutter's Fort on his own. On October the 7th, one of the, the wagon train members, a man named Louis Kiesberg, who is a German immigrant, turns a Mr. Hardcoop, who is a Norwegian immigrant, out of his wagon. Most of the people are walking at this point because it's the, the road is too hard for the oxen, so they can't ride in the wagons because that puts too much more weight on the oxen, and so mostly they just sleep in the wagons. Mr. Hardcoop can't walk anymore. His feet are swollen up. He's in really bad shape. He's an elderly man. The last anybody sees him, nobody else picked him up either. The last anybody else sees him is that he's sitting there by the side of the trail and we assume that he just died, which seems kind of horrible. On October the 11th, the Paiute Indians killed 21 of the party's oxen and stole 18 more. At this point in the journey, the party has lost more than a hundred of its animals so far. On October the 16th, they arrive at the Truckee River, which is at the base of the Sierra Nevada mountains. So they're getting close. They're getting close to the end and now. On October the 25th, Charles Stanton returns from Fort Sutter with supplies. William McCutcheon had been ill and he had stayed behind, but he's planning on coming back, coming forward and rejoining the party when he's able to travel. On October the 28th, James Reed arrives at Sutter's Fort. He spends a couple of days gathering up horses and, and more supplies, and on October the 30th, he and McCutcheon start back towards the, the people that are the, the Donner Party, but they are stopped by heavy snow. October the 30th, first mention of snow. On October the 31st, the front axle on George Donner's wagon broke and he injures his hand very badly fixing it. So his family, the two families, his family and his brother's family, stay behind for a couple of days and they're a couple of days behind the rest of the party while he tries to heal up and you know they try to help him with his hand. Okay, we're into November. On November the 1st, the party stops at the lake for the night. They are only a thousand feet from the summit of the pass. Now, whether they knew they were only a thousand, if they, if they knew they were that close, I'm not sure, but they knew they were close and they know it's November, but they decide to stop for the night. Overnight, it starts to snow. And in the morning, when they get up, on November the 2nd and start to go to try to go through the pass to go over the last part of the mountains and be on the downhill slide and now you're already in California you're only about 150 miles from from Sutter's Fort they find that there is five feet of snow in the pass and they can't get through of all the bad decisions this one was the worst one. This is the one that costs them the most. So they can't get through this pass. And they're hoping that, you know, this is an early snow and it's going to melt and they'll be able to go on through the pass. So they go back down to the lake and make camp to wait to see if the pass is going to thaw. Well, the pass doesn't thaw. On November the 20th, Patrick Breen, this gentleman here, actually begins keeping a diary and reports it by the, November the 20th. They have already killed off most of their cattle and they are almost completely out of supplies. And it's November. He also reports that it has snowed for eight days without stopping. Now, at this point, I should tell you that the winter of 1846 was in California, one of the snowiest winters they'd ever had on record at that point. I don't know how long they'd been keeping records, but it was an unusually snowy winter. And the Donner Party is parked out here in the middle of it. The place where they camped had at least one cabin that had already been built and abandoned. They built another cabin and then they had some tents that they stayed in. It was not 
a good camp. They hadn't had a chance to gather up wood. You know, people back then when they were living uh, in, in an area where they knew it was going to be a hard winter, they chopped wood all summer long and stacked it so that it would be dry and ready like we do for firewood now. And they had none of that. They hadn't had a chance to, to hunt all during the summer and build up stocks of dried meat to have during the winter. They had nothing. And it's November. Okay, so in December, on December the 15th, the first guy dies in the uh, camp. His name was Bayless Willa Williams, and he was one of the Reed's Teamsters. They believe he may have died of a fever. He didn't starve to death, they don't think. But starvation would have been already setting in, and that may have complicated whatever was wrong and made him die sooner. Just don't know. On December the 16th, 17 people started out on snowshoes with six days of rations to try to cross the pass. Later on in history, this expedition, I guess we'll call them, is known as the Forlorn Hope because this was the only hope they had of getting anybody out and trying to get help. On December the 17th, two of the members of the Forlorn Hope decided they couldn't keep up and so they returned back to camp. On December the 21st, the Forlorn Hope runs out of rations. Charles Stanton was too weak to continue and so he stayed in camp and told the others to just go on and we assume he died because he's never seen again. On December the 24th, members of the Forlorn Hope are lost in the snow and they're starving Two members of the party have died in the camp at this point. On December the 25th, two more members die. And on December the 26th, the Forlorn Hope members resort to eating the bodies of the people who have died. They, they have decided to, that they have to engage in survival cannibalism. Uh, some of the survivors wrote that basically, you know, nobody could even look at each other while this was happening. And, and a big deal is made out of cannibalism on the Donner Party because, you know, it's, it's pretty horrible, but it's not uncommon. People have done this. People in the British Navy did this regularly. If they were shipwrecked, they would choose lots and kill somebody so they could eat and the rest of them would survive. It was just accepted, but it's still, it's a horrible thing. It's a bad situation to be in where, you know, it's this or you die yourself and your children are with you and maybe they're gonna die too. It's a horrible situation. <coughs> Get into January now, so we're into 1847. On January the 7th, the Forlorn Hope manages to kill a deer, but another member of the, the group dies during the night. On the 8th, most of the party at the lake are down to eating oxen hides that have been boiled. That's the only food they have. Hides, skins of oxen that have been killed and then boiled because they'd already eaten all of the meat. On January the 12th, the Forlorn Hope reaches an Indian village, which is a very poor Indian village, but they do feed these people some acorn bread so they, they have something to eat. On the 17th, the Forlorn Hope travels to another village where six members remain in the village and one man, his name was Eddie, continues on to another settlement to find help. He reaches the settlement and you know they, the, the, the people follow his tracks back to find the, the village where these other six people are. On January the 24th at the lake camp, the infant Lewis Kiesberg Jr. dies. We're now, we're getting into the starvation pretty big now. On January the 29th, the Forlorn Hope sends a letter to John Sinclair, who is the mayor of Sacramento, describing their situation and asking for help. And Sinclair begins gathering up a rescue party. <coughs> On July the, I'm sorry, January the 30th, Breen writes between, about trouble between Mrs. Graves and Mrs. Reed. Now these are the two families that had the fight that caused Mr. Reed to get banished. And these two women apparently did not get along and they were trying to share a cabin. And they were fighting over food. It, it, it got pretty ugly and it, it continued on for a good little while. In February of 1847, on the 4th, two more women die at the camp. 
on February the 4th also, the first relief party leaves for the lake with supplies. So they've gathered up their first relief party, I think it was about seven people, and they start up the trail to take supplies to these people at the Donner Camp. <coughs> they reach the Donner Camp on February the 19th, and on the 22nd, they have gathered up 23 people who are in reasonably decent shape, and they think can maybe make it to, to walk back out, and they set out back towards Fort Sutter, and the second relief party sets out from Fort Sutter for the mountains. On the 23rd, Patrick Green reports that there had been 14 more deaths in the camp. And that's the day after they've left with the, with the supply, the, with the rescuers. That's sad. On February the 26th, Green reports that Mrs. Murphy has told him that she is completely out of food <coughs> and she's considering eating the flesh of the people who have died. Now, they've eaten even their dogs at this point. There is no food. They've eaten most of the hides. There's nothing else to eat. So we're into March now. On March the 1st, the second relief party arrives at Donner Camp. On March the 2nd, 17 survivors leave with the members of the second relief party. Three rescuers stay behind with those who were too weak to travel to maybe help them. Hopefully they can give them some food and get them where they could travel. On March the 5th, and it never did go into what, why all this happened, and it was kind of weird. Two of the rescuers, two men named Charles Stone and Charles Cady, tell Tamsin Donner that they will take her two children to safety, and she agrees to send her two children. She won't leave because her husband, George, had hurt his hand, remember, and he's really sick, and he is dying at this point. But they take her children to another cabin and just leave them there. So I don't know what went on with that. Um, between March the 5th and the 7th, there is a huge snowstorm that traps the second relief party on top of the pass for two days. This becomes known as the starved camp because they have already run out of rations in those two days. I don't know what they were planning on doing. And three members of the party die and they are cannibalized. On March the 13th, the third relief party arrives at the Donner Camp and finds that there are only nine people still alive. Four of those people leave with the rescuers. <coughs> Tamsin Donner refuses to leave. She wants to stay with her dying husband, and the others are all too weak to go. On March the 20th, about March the 20th, George Donner finally dies. Tamsin does what she can to bury his body, which is not a whole lot because it's all snow. Uh, and then she travels to Lewis Kiesberg's cabin, <coughs> but she actually dies later that same night. So we're in April of 1847. On April the 17th, the fourth relief party arrives at the Donner Camp and Lewis Kiesberg is the only person left alive. On April the 21st, the fourth relief party leaves for Fort Sutter. And on April 29th, Louis Keysburg, who is the last member of the party, reaches Sutter's Fort. This is more than a year after they originally set out on this journey that was supposed to take four months. This is bad. Okay, the outcome of all of this. When they peeled off and when people joined as everybody could join them together, 89 people <coughs> were part of the Donner Party and eventually 81 of those people were trapped in the mountains. Of those 89 people, 41 of them died and 48 survived. Stories of cannibalism were widespread. It doesn't look like there was really that much of that that went on. And it was a survival thing. It wasn't like, you know, yeah, we just want to try this. This sounds cool. It wasn't that. It was eat this or die. And there is still a Donner Pass today. And it has um, places where you can stop and see what happened. You know, historical markers, basically. <clears throat> and it's named Donner Pass. And it's the last pass through the Sierra Nevadas. So 
there you go. You can go and see that if you, and, and it's part of the National Park Service. And it's kind of interesting. So I don't know about you, but disasters are always the kind of stuff I like to read about. I don't know what this says about me. It's probably not good. But this is one of the biggest disasters of the Manifest Destiny movement. And it all boils down to, if you just made a few better decisions, you wouldn't have been in this place. But I guess most disasters are like that, unless it's, you know, I don't know what. So anyway, that's the story of the Donner Party. I hope it wasn't too gross for you. But, you know, it's kind of interesting. So please let me know what you think. Leave me a comment. Let me know what I what you would like me to talk about next time. I guess we're done, Sully. See you next time.